and I'll tell you about a few things going on, and then we'll continue with our liturgy. First, I just want to welcome all of you here, whether you're here in church or um, watching us from home. I'm delighted that you could be with us today. And I want to remind you that um, the kids will have a chance to meet online at 9 a.m. this morning, and the adults at 9.30. Uh, we both meet for coffee hour or snacks, and uh, it's a bring your own. So uh, please join us on Zoom for that, and I'd uh, love to see more folks uh, be able to join us in that. also want to remind you about our Lenten program that we'll have on Wednesday evenings during Lent. It'll be at 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. It's on Zoom, so it doesn't matter. You don't have to come to church. You just have to have a computer or a tablet or some device that will allow you to uh, get onto Zoom and be part of the conversation. We'll be studying the Sermon on the Mount by A.J. Levine. She's written a delightful book. We'll be using that book and we'll see her do some videotaped lessons. I was able to see one of the lessons from a DVD that a friend of mine has. It's just delightful. She does a great job. And then we'll break out into groups and discuss it. The deal is that we're doing this with um, four other churches. So you may be in a group with folks from Christ Church in Castle Rock or the Lutheran Church in Castle Rock. It would be a great way for us to be able to have some Wednesday evenings and see folks from not only St. Matthews, but some of our fellow Christians. So I would invite you to join us. Please rise and we'll continue on with the liturgy. Remember, you're part of it is up here on the screen, and all of your responses are in bold. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your grace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Please join me in the Jubilate. Be joyful in the Lord, all the elders. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before us the presence of the song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are the Lord's. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to the Lord from age to age. Please be seated. Please read Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6 in unison. The Lord our God our God has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of time, perfect in its beauty, God has revealed himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and around God and a great storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me my fellow followers, those who have made a covenant with 
was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was ordered to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Please join with me in the song of the redeemed. O ruler of the universe, Lord God, great peace of the nature of the Lord, surpass the human understanding. Your ways are the ways of righteousness and truth, O King of all ages. Who can fail to do your homage, O Lord, and sing in the grace? For you are the Lord of the world. All nations will bow in here and all down before you. Because the justice of the Lord has been revealed. Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, as now, and will be forever. Amen. reading from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus, as they were coming down the mountain. He ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts 
be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. In the Narnia Chronicles, C.S. Lewis writes, there are a number of people and animals and spirit beings that make up various different teams that we find in the story. The, but the primary, the primary people who are in the story are Aslan, the great lion, and the Pavensi children, Peter, and Susan, and Edmund, and Lucy. And Lucy is the first one to find her way into Narnia when they're playing hide and go seek. And she enters in through a magic wardrobe. When she comes, comes out and has spent a long time there and is afraid that her friends, her brother and sisters, will, will be missing her, she comes back out and she finds that no time has passed at all. And they didn't realize that she had been gone and hear what she was worried. But the second person to find his way in is Edmund. But he doesn't tell her that he's found his way in. He tricks her. He teases her, like the rest of them do. Doesn't believe that there's really a Narnia. He doesn't want them to know that he's been there too, because he met the White Witch. And the White Witch has made it always winter, but never Christmas. Never, never Christmas. But Edmund has been told that if he'll bring his, his brother and sisters back with him, that the White Witch will give him something special. So he does go back. Now I'm going to skip now to, I've just given you a taste of what, what it begins with. But all four of the children end up in Narnia. Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy. And all of this happens in the very first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And one of the things that happens in that book is Aslan, the great lion, Aslan gives his life for Edmund. Because even though Edmund has betrayed his brother and sisters, Aslan doesn't want to see him be put to death. So Aslan agrees to die in his place. Even though Aslan has done nothing wrong. And the white witch is thrilled. She gets to kill Aslan. And so she tortures him, lays him out on a stone table, shaves off his mane, and finally kills him. And when Lucy comes later to untie him, as she's doing so, she realizes that, that the mice have already chewed through his ropes. And all of a sudden, Aslan is alive again. He's resurrected. Now, that's the very beginning of this story. That's what, what it's like with Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy. And Narnia is a wonderful, wonderful place. And they go on to rule for years and years and years. But in the other books that follow, slowly, one by one, as they grow older, the older children are told not to expect to come back to Narnia because they're getting too old, too adult, and they're encouraged to find Aslan in their own world, in our world. They're encouraged to find this Christ figure in our world. Well, fast forward to the last book. It's called The Last Battle. And even though the older children have been told not to expect to ever come back to Narnia again, they all of a sudden all appear in Narnia. And their friend, King Caspian, who had been a very young man when they first met him, and a prince, he's now fighting the battle of his life against evil. Because after all, that's what the, good, the books are about. They're the story of the battle between good and evil. But the Pevensey children have come back, and they're there at the last battle.
They're there to give Caspian life and encouragement and vitality, to give him strength, to give him a way to keep fighting. Just when he had lost all hope, hope arrives in the form of Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy. There they are once again. And he knows that if they're there, then surely Aswell, Aswell will come and all will not be lost. I, I tell you this because it's important to recognize what a team does and how a team of people can be important to us, can be important to our lives. And C.S. Lewis wasn't the first one or the only one to write about a team like this. Not at all. If you'll travel with me to a galaxy far, far away, you'll remember, perhaps, our favorite Jedi Knight, Luke Skywalker. And as Luke is about to go into battle with Darth Vader, very dangerous battle, who comes to him but Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi? And they give him strength. They tell him, Luke, remember the Force. Remember the Force. And he's able to go in and do the battle that he's supposed to do. And another friend of C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, he wrote The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And of course, there's a hero to the book. Bilbo Baggins in the, in the Hobbit, the first one. And then in the Lord of the Rings series, Frodo. But they're never alone. Frodo goes with Sam. He doesn't travel by himself. And Sam will never leave him alone. In fact, Sam says, Mr. Frodo, I know that you have promised to go to Mordor all by yourself. And that's fine, but I'm coming with you because I made a vow to never leave you. And I won't, no matter what happens, I won't leave you. And so the hobbits travel together, and they end up with an elf to help them, and dwarves. And again, there's this group of people, this group of creatures, that all help one another as they travel through some really terrible battles. And again, it's a story about good versus evil. And if you want to look at a more modern writer, then we can look at, at J.K. Rowling and the Harry Potter series. Again, the series about good versus evil, that's what the story is about. The whole Harry Potter books are about good versus evil. And in the very, very last book, when Harry has decided that he's given up, he, he can't ask his friends to fight for him any longer. Too many of them have died. He decides that he's going to go himself and give himself to Voldemort and allow Voldemort to kill him. And in that way, he hopes that his friends will be able to carry on. But as Harry leaves and walks through the woods to find Voldemort, who comes with him? Well, his parents who died for him, his mom, his dad, Sirius, his godfather, who had died again to try and save Harry, to try and help Harry be able to battle Voldemort. Other friends who died ahead of him in this battle. I tell you all this because all of these are teams of people, teams that, that come to someone when they absolutely need it. And I have to believe that all of this is just an example of what happened on that mountaintop with Jesus, when Elijah and Moses came to encourage Jesus. He had just told his disciples, I'm about to go to Jerusalem, and there I'll be tortured and killed. And his disciples didn't want him to go. But he knew that he had 
had to go. He knew that despite what would happen to him, he had to do this. And so when he goes up on the mountain to pray, to gather strength, who comes to him? Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses, the law and the prophets, saying, we'll be with you. We know what you're going to go through. You can do this. That happens to a lot of us when we have something going on in our lives. We know that there are people who come to us. Some of those people are people who are still living, and some of them are people who have already died, but they come to us anyway, and they give us strength. They give us hope. They give us that little bit that we need to be able to continue moving on, taking the very next step. That's what we need. So I guess I would ask you, who are your Elijah and Moses? Who are the people who come to you when you really need it? When you're at wit's end, when you've lost all of your ideas, when you've lost all of your hope, who comes to you and says, I'm here with you. You can do this. You can take the next step. Who are those people? The other thing that I would ask you is, who do you go to when they need help? Who calls on you? Who relies on you to be that person for them? Who relies on you to stand there with them, to walk with them, to be with them? We all need that. None of us goes through this life alone. We all go through this life with other people. And even though we feel like we have a personal relationship with God, and we do, we all have a personal relationship with God, though. It puts us in the same boat together. We don't do this alone. We do this, yes, with God, but we all do it together. And we help one another. No one simply becomes a Christian by thinking about it. We become Christians by being introduced, by having someone else tell us the story, by having someone else help us to learn what it is. That's just the way that this faith works. It's not something that we can go meditate on and all of a sudden come up with. It's something that a friend tells us, a parent tells us, a grandparent. Those are the people in our lives who love us enough to say, I know about God, and I want you to know about God. So, who have you told? Who have you reached out to? Who have you shared God with? Those are wonderful things. As we think about the wonderful story of the Transfiguration today, we think about the people in our lives who have brought us this faith that's so dear to us. And we think about the people to whom we have brought our faith and shared it and said, I know this great God. You need to know him too. You need to know him too. In the name of Christ.
groceries this week. Jenny and Michael Schaefer. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, the most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. Now we are not known, things done and left undone. And so, hold us by your spirit, that we may live and serve you in this life. To the honor and glory of your name, we do Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now, without shaking hands or patting each other on the back, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. This is our calling for well-being. It's a way for us to continue praying for all of those who are uh, concerned with the COVID-19 disease. Precious God of resurrection, health, and life, we give you thanks for all those who are working to rid our lives and our world of the COVID-19 disease that has harmed too many lives. We ask your blessing on all those afflicted with the disease and upon their families who care for them. Help us to move to a time when we will share your love with all of the body of Christ and to minister to one another in love and graciousness. Guide us to care for all those whose lives are inextricably linked with ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in this prayer for my Saint Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time and the Lord to make our common salvation. And you have promised to be well the Son, that the two or three are gathered together in the nation will be the of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. To be seated, I'll uh, share a couple of other announcements with you. I want to remind you that this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and we will have an Ash Wednesday service via on Zoom, so it won't be here at the church. I'll be at home on my computer, and you'll all be at home on your computers. And we should have ashes here this morning for you to take with you. You can use those ashes at the service that we'll do on Wednesday evening at 6.30, or you can use them on your own first thing in the morning whatever you would like to do. I know some folks will take the ashes with them to work and, and share them there. Others will share them with their family. There's lots and lots of opportunities. But again, it's up to you to, to use them the best way for you. Uh, and you're welcome to save them until the service that we have that evening and use them then. And one of the things that you might choose to do is um, when we're at church on Ash Wednesday, you're used to me putting ashes on your forehead. But there's no requirement that says a priest has to do that, or a deacon, or a lay reader. Anybody can put ashes on someone else's head. And one of the things that, that uh, intrigues me most when I do Ash Wednesday and I put ashes on people's foreheads is I'm always amazed when I put ashes on the forehead of a little child because even they know that, that somehow we don't live forever. And they don't have the same understanding that you and I have of it. And they don't worry about their life ending as much as some of us worry about it. But we can return that favor sometimes. We can ask the young children in our household, if we have any, to put ashes on us and 
see what that's like for them to do that, using those same words. Remember that you are dust, and then to dust you shall return. Those are the words that we use, whether we put ashes on ourselves, our own forehead, or whether we ask someone else to put them on the for us. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It's one of the best ways that we can start Lent, is to use ashes to remind us of our mortality, to remind us that Jesus came for us and died for us, and to remind us that when Lent is over, we'll get to Easter and the resurrection. Because Lent is about helping us to remember why we need to be penitent, why we need to be sorry. Easter is about telling us even no matter what we've done, every bit of it is forgiven. Every bit of it. So that's just a little bit about what's going to happen this week. And I would ask you, please, join in whatever way works best for you. Pick up some ashes. Take them with you this morning. Um, if you're at home and need to pick them up, you can pick them up from the office. Uh, I'll be here for a while after the 1030 service. And you're welcome to drop by pick some up then as well. Please rise and we'll continue with the blessing and dismissal in our final hymn. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. I hope you've enjoyed all the hallelujahs in our service today, because we won't say any of those again until Easter, so enjoy our final hymn.